on the 30th of March 2010, Nazi war criminal Martin Sandberger died in a care home in Stuttgart, aged 98. Sandberger was the last of the major criminals to die. And without a doubt he was a major criminal, having the blood of tens of thousands of people on his hands. He died totally forgotten, but he died at a time when interest in National Socialist crimes was at a height because of the publicity surrounding the trial of John Demjanjuk. Demjanjuk was a nothing in the scheme of things, a lowly guard at the Sobibor death camp. Sandberger was a major decision maker in the killing of thousands of people. This is his story and the story of how he got away with mass murder. Sandberger was born in Berlin Charlottenburg on the 17th of August 1911. His father was a director in a chemical concern and the company had sent him to the capital from Württemberg in southwest Germany. He therefore came from a wealthy background which allowed Sandberger to study law at the universities of Munich, Cologne, Freiburg and Tübingen. He was only 20 when he joined the National Socialist German Workers' Party and the SA in 1931. He became the leader of the National Socialist Group at his university. On the 8th of March 1933, the day of the general election in Germany, in what may be seen as a typical student prank, he raised the swastika flag over the university. He did this with Erich Erlinger, whose career path is very similar to that of Sandberger, later commanding an Essets Einsatzgruppe in the Baltic States and spending very little time in prison for it, going on to live well into his 90s. But that's a story for another time. Sandberger concluded his studies with a thesis on on social insurance in the National Socialist State. Back to basics, insurance or care. He received the highest mark possible the first time in nine years that it had been awarded. He became a full-time worker in the National Socialist Students' Organization. In 1936, he joined the SS. The same year, the head of the Students' Organization, Gustav Adolf Schill, recruited him for the security police, the SD, in Württemberg. Schell was yet another war criminal that got away with very little punishment after the war, but once more that's a story for another time. Sandberger rose to the rank of SS Sturmbahnführer, that's approximate equivalent of Major, in 1938. Following the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of August 1939, and the invasion and occupation of Poland, Heinrich Himmler sought to bring ethnic Germans either back to Germany or to settle them in the occupied parts of Poland, displacing the Polish farmers to make way for them. This policy was called the Heim in Reich, which could be translated as Home in the Reich, or even Return to the Nation. On the 13th of October 1939, Sandberger was appointed to be the head of Northeast Immigration in the office which was located in the occupied Polish port city of Gdynia. From here, he was moved to deporting Jews from the newly annexed town of Strasbourg, which had been in France up until the occupation of that country in June 1940. After the invasion of the USSR, Sandberger was appointed to be the leader of Einsatzkommando 1A. The Einsatzkommando were mobile murder squads who would move from area to area, killing those that the crazed conspiracy theories of the Third Reich deemed to be their enemies. Sandberger was to murder alongside another wealthy, educated lawyer from Tübingen, Dr. Walter Stalecker. Years later, and close to death, Sandberger gave an interview to the German magazine Der Spiegel. In this interview, he claimed that he was not really involved in what was going on at the time. But not so, according to the evidence. 
His report of the 1st of July 1941, just 10 days after the invasion of the USSR, notes that 941 Jews had been killed. This map, prepared by Memnon 335 BC and using information from the 1982 book by Helmut Krausnick and Hans Heinrich Wilhelm on the Einsatzgruppen, shows the murderous march of Einsatzgruppen 1A through the Baltic states behind the German army. The method of killing was to round the victims up and then take them to an already prepared grave site and shoot them. Often this was with the help of locals eager to loot the property of their victims. When Riga was captured on the 1st of July 1941, the synagogues were destroyed within three days and around 400 people murdered, some through incineration in the burning buildings. At the same time, groups of racist thugs were set, were set up to hunt down Jews and foment pogroms. Within three months, around 6,000 of the 40,000 Jews of Riga were murdered. German forces crossed the Estonian border on 7th of July 1941. Sandberger's killing squad soon followed. In September 1941, he reported that he had everything he needed to carry out the final solution. Friedrich Anijag, a guard in the Jagala camp, testified after the war that Dr. Sandberger was present at the shooting site at the mass killing in Kalevi Liva, Estonia. There's no evidence to support this claim, and it could well be that whereas Sandberger gave the orders to drive the victims to the murder sites, he found an excuse to be somewhere else whilst the killing was going on. The pre-war Jewish population of Estonia was only around 4,000 people. Of these, some 500 or so had been deported to the Gulags following the Soviet occupation of 1940. However, Jewish people had fled to Estonia or were deported there by the Nazis. These people were now to be killed. In October, Sandberger said that all Jewish men in Estonia, except for doctors and essential workers, had been killed. On the 3rd of December 1941, Sandberger was appointed commander of the security police, SIPO, and security service, SD, in Estonia. In the report recommending his promotion, we read, he is distinguished by his great industry and better than average intensity in his work. From the professional point of view, Sandberger has proved himself in the Reich as well as in his assignment in the East. Sandberger is a versatile SS Führer, suitable for employment. Sandberger belongs to the officers of the leadership service and has fulfilled the requirements of the promotion regulations up to the minimum age set by the RFSS, that is to say Himmler, who would set the age at 36. Because of his political service and his efforts, which far exceed the average, the chief of the SIPO and SD already supports his preferential promotion to SS Standartenführer. In January 1942, Stalaker reported that there were no more Jews in Estonia. By the summer of 1942, four out of five people murdered in Estonia were suspected of being communists. Sandberger was able to report to Berlin that no mercy or compassion was being shown to them. In September 1943, Sandberger was transferred to Verona, Italy. Italy had just surrendered and changed sides. The north of the country had been occupied by the Nazis. Sandberger's job was in intelligence. There was a plot to bring Pope Pius XII to Germany. Liechtenstein Castle near Reutlingen had been proposed as a suitable residence. On the 1st of October 1943, he reported that the Vatican was afraid of communism and also afraid of Anglo-American rule and might agree to a move to Liechtenstein if this were proposed. In the meantime, 
The first train of Jews from Rome to Auschwitz left on the 18th of October 1943 at 9 in the morning. It arrived four days later and the transportees were murdered on arrival. For the remaining one and a half years of the war, Sandberger was head of Group 6A in the Foreign Intelligence Service working with Himmler. On the 1st of May, that is the day after Hitler committed suicide, Sandberger was allegedly seen with Himmler in Lübeck, although this report may not be true. On the 25th of May 1945, he voluntarily surrendered to officers of the 42nd US Division in Kitzbühel, Austria, identifying himself via his paybook. In part two, I shall examine what happened to Sandberger after the war and how he literally got away with mass murder. Thanks for watching.